Hello, my name is Eva and I run the account Notation is Great on Twitter. So for this second video of this channel, I've decided to talk about modal notation. So modal notation is typically associated uh, with the Notre Dame School uh, of Medieval Music. Uh, and the name is a bit problematic because not all of this repertoire that I'm going to talk about was composed in Notre Dame or for Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, but that's the name that most musicologists use, so I'm just going to stick with that. So, uh, one of the main musical forms used in the Notre Dame school, uh, which ranged from the mid 12th to the 13th century, is the so called organum. And you can see an example of this here. So in organum you have a lower voice, a tenor, uh, which basically sings a plain chant melody but with very long notes. So each of the notes is elongated for several seconds or sometimes even minutes. And on top of that voice you have one or two or three voices which sing faster melodies using certain kinds of rhythmic patterns. And so one of the greatest achievements of uh, modern notation was to find a way of notating those rhythmic patterns. So up until that point, most notation didn't have any indication of rhythm and pulse. So today we'll see what, is the, what this is about. So before I start talking about rhythm, I would like to have a look again at the score I've just showed you, which comes from a manuscript commonly known as W2, and W stands for Wolfenbüttel in Germany. So if we have a look at this, again there are a number of elements that we can recognize. So we have three voices uh, which are written vertically, so one on top of each other, and this is actually not that common in later scores. So later on uh, voices are not written vertically, but here they are. And if you look at the left hand side of each of the lines, uh, you can see the clef, so it's a C clef, so it, it does look like a C. So obviously this tells us where the C is. We have the staff, which is five lines, the same as we know today. We also have some vertical lines, which might look a bit like bar lines, but they are not. So we'll come back to that later on. And then finally, you look at the notes, uh, you see that they appear in groups of three, four, two, sometimes they appear in isolation. Well, these groupings are very important. So these groupings are called ligatures. And the way in which these ligatures are distributed is going to give us a very important clue about the rhythm. So what you need to know about rhythm in this type of repertoire is that there's a basic beat or unit, which is subdivided into three parts. So it's a bit like our 3-8 or 6-8 when you have 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, etc. And so within each of these bits or units you have to fit a number of note values. Uh, so basically you have two main note values in this repertoire. You have the longa or long and the brevis or short. Now in our current notation uh, we know that for example a quaver will always be the equivalent of two semiquavers, unless you have a triplet, but that's a different story. But in this type of repertoire, it all depends on the context. So longas and brevis can have slightly different proportions to each other, depending on the context. So um, I'm going to show you now a slide from Willy Apple's book on the notation of polyphonic music, which is a book I, I recommend if you are interested in medieval and Renaissance music. And here Apple is giving you, obviously based on medieval treatises, he's giving you the different types of combinations of note values that you have in this repertoire, or in other words, the six modes that you can find in this repertoire, okay? So let's have a look at this. So numbers one and two are quite straightforward. So if you have a longa and a brevis or a brevis and a longa as part of the same beat, then the longa will be two subdivisions and the brevis will be one. So mode number one would be something like long short, long short, long short. And then mode number two would be short long, short long, short long. So that's quite straightforward. 
If we move on to modes five and six, I know I'm skipping three and four, but I promise I'll go back. So in modes five and six, it's relatively straightforward as well. So if you have one long after another, then it makes sense that each of these long notes is going to be one full beat, okay? And if you have all short notes, it makes sense that each of these short notes is going to be one of these subdivisions. So in other words, you have three shorts per each beat. Now, what happens in numbers three and four when you have one long followed by two shorts or two shorts followed by one long? Well, if you start with a long, then it makes sense that that long is going to be one full beat, okay? But then you have two shorts that you need to fit within one beat. So how are you going to do that? Because remember I said you cannot uh, go over, you can have syncopations. So basically, in that case, what happens is that the second short is made slightly longer to make up the three beats. So in other words, the first short will be one subdivision and the second short will be two subdivisions. And in mode four, it's exactly the other way around. So what you have is long, short, short, long, short, short, long, etc. Or short, short, long, short, short, long, short, short, long, etc. So the thing with rhythmic modes in that repertoire is that normally uh, you pick up one at the beginning of the piece and then you stick to it for at least one section of the piece. But in other words, you normally wouldn't be changing from one mode to another, you just stick to one. So in order to know what mode a passage or a piece is in, what you have to look at is the ligatures, if you remember. So the ways in which notes are grouped is going to tell you the mode. So we have this slide here, again from Apple's book, which gives you the key. So for example, if you observe a piece and you discover that the notes are grouped, so you have a group of three followed by groups of two, which could be four, could be more than that, then we will be in the first mode. So in other words, when you have a ligature, it's not that uh, each of the notes has a specific value. I mean, it's not that a ligature of three notes, so is the first note a long or a brevis or what? Well, this will depend again on the context. So modal notation is all about the context. So if we go back to our W2 manuscript, so I'm going to be looking just at the upper voice. So we see that the first note here is just one note which is okay because normally in this repertoire the first note is a long note of an indeterminate duration which just establishes the the mode or the key so to speak. So if we start looking after that what we find is three notes then two then two and then a vertical line then again three notes two notes two notes and then we have one note two notes two notes and two notes. But really, those um, first notes can count as a three-note ligature because normally when you have the same pitch repeated one after the other, these notes cannot be joined as a ligature, so they will be written as one note followed by two notes, so it really counts as a three-note ligature. So I think it's quite clear here that we have a 3 to 2 pattern and if we go back to Apple, this is mode number one. So it's long, short, long, short, long, short, long. Na, 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 na. And that last note before the vertical line takes up the whole beat, okay? Because the vertical bar line, it's, it's not really a bar line, but what it tells me is there's a rest here or there's a small pause here or the, there's an end of the phrase here. So I need to start the mode again in the next segment. Okay. Uh, there's also something I wanted to show you in the third segment of uh, this piece, which is that if you look at the first note, you can see that there's a vertical bar line to the right. Can you see that? Well, that's called applica. Okay, and applica is always to the right. You find some lines on the left, but these are not applicas. Applica is always on the right. And so applica is a kind of ornament and it's a descending note. So in this case, the note it's attached to, it's a G, 
so the plica is a descending note so it will be an F and basically the plica uh, needs to be fitted within the duration of the note it's attached to okay in other words it does not change the, the, the mode, it does not change the rhythm, it has to be fitted in in the same way as you would fit in a, a grace note without changing the, the rhythm. So in my transcription here uh, I have written it in red so that you can see it, I mean normally you, you wouldn't in an edition and basically because the note it's attached to would be a long, here I've notated the plica as a uh, as a quaver, okay, so so basically the long would be a crotchet and the plica takes half of the value of that note. So let's have a look at a different manuscript, so this is the Pluteus or Florence manuscript, so let's have a look at the upper voice. So the first note is one long note, as we expected, and then what we have is one, three, 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 one, three, three, one three 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 so it seems pretty consistent and Apple tells us that this pattern is mode number three so long short short long short short long short short no 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 so that was pretty straightforward so let me show you something in the second line in the second voice sorry so uh, the second voice basically follows the same mode as uh, the upper voice here but if you look at that last segment uh, at the end of the line you see these diamond shaped notes that we haven't seen before so these diamond shaped notes are called currentes or running notes and basically running notes like plicas are a kind of ornament so when you have three or more currentes they stand for a longer note value which can be a longa or a brevis so here those currentes are standing in the place of a longa so in my transcription I've transcribed the three currentes as three quavers so they stand for a longa which could be a, a full beat so there's just a couple more things you need to know before you start doing your own transcriptions of modal notation. So the first of those is about the lower voice or tenor. So the tenor isn't written in a particular mode, so it's just a succession of long notes. And basically you know when the note changes because it's aligned with the upper voices. Sometimes the alignment is not completely clear and in those cases it's really helpful to have a knowledge of harmonic theory of that period because you know uh, which intervals are more suitable than others. And then the second thing is that you might find very similar things to the ligatures in other medieval repertoires. So for example in plain chant we might you might find some of those same signs, but they don't mean the same. So as I said at the beginning, in a lot of medieval music, it's all about the context. So the same thing can mean different things depending on what comes next, what comes after that, depending on the repertoire. So hopefully we'll get to cover some of those topics in other videos. So that's me for today. So I hope you've learned something from this video. If you have, I would like to encourage you to consider donating to one or more uh, COVID-19 fans for musicians. So you have a couple of links here. Uh, other than that, I hope you enjoyed this video. Goodbye.